Welcome to Kidney Conversations with Remend, a webinar designed for patients by patients and where we have open, honest discussions about kidney care. Thanks for joining us. Remend is a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring organization that helps encourage people with kidney disease make informed decisions about their kidney health. We're a network of individuals who've experienced chronic kidney illness, dialysis, and or kidney transplant. We offer advice and emotional support to motivate and empower those who are on their kidney journey. Take a moment to visit remen.org, explore the work we do, and discover how you can join us in offering support to individuals nav navigating their kidney journey. Our goal today is to empower you with practical knowledge about certain medications while speaking in simple terms that anyone can grasp. We believe that understanding your kidney medication should be as easy as chatting with a friend. According to nephew.org, patients are increasingly relying on their trusted local pharmacists for help with their medications. 72% of consumer patients regularly are asking their pharmacist about medications. Today, we'll get an inside view from a clinical pharmacist on kidney care, diabetes and hypertension management, dietary supplements, and the importance of adhering to medication treatment. We hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll walk away with feeling more confident and informed about taking care of those incredible organs. So get ready to dive into some conversation that revolves around your kidneys' well being. Before we begin, we have some quick housekeeping items. Please type your questions in the QA box. Don't be nervous to do that. We love questions. So please share those with us in the QA box. We also have a short survey after the webinar and you can complete it anonymously. Your participation really helps us decide the content we produce, and it assures us that we're highlighting the topics that you wanna learn more about. Um, something new that we're doing too, we also have a poll that we'll start in just a moment, so please feel free to participate. So without further ado, which is the funniest saying to me, let me introduce our panelists today. Charmaine Griffith. She is a Remen mentor and has been since 2013, and she's also an insurance coordinator with Fresenius Medical Care. Cindy Polis is a registered nurse and care management and education nurse with Balboa Nephrology. Patrick Wilson is a clinical pharmacist and diabetes educator, board certified ambulatory care pharmacist, and certified diabetes care and education specialist with UC San Diego Health and he's the founder of Prescription Strength Health Coach. And hey, that's me. <laughs> I'm Kiku Boyens. I'm the Executive direct Director for Remen, a nonprofit organization, as well as the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Balboa family of brands, including Balboa United, Balboa Research, and Balboa Nephrology. So let's kick things off by seeing everyone here. Hey, guys. Hey. Thanks for being here, guys. Hi, everyone. How's Thanks it going? Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks, Tiku. So, you're welcome, Cindy. Thank you for being here once again. So I want to kick things off um, with a question for our panelists, just to kind of break the ice a little bit. Um, let's give some insight on what you do in your work for the kidney community. Who would like to go first? Charmaine. <laughs> I'll go first. Thank um, you. So as you mentioned, I've been with Remend since uh, almost since the beginning. And I reach out to uh, to patients who are who are referred to Remend. I reach out to them to connect them with a mentor for um, for support along their kidney journey and uh, share a little bit about my story and, and what Remend is about and to give them hope and let them know that they're not alone. Um, and also I work with, uh, for Fresenius as an insurance coordinator. So it's just pretty amazing actually to be able to, um, do this for a living as well, <laughs> to, to have a job that pays the bills, uh, that I get to talk to dialysis patients, their families and help them navigate through, um, just the, the web of insurance. And, you know, especially if they're going to be leaving their job because they can't work any longer things like that, um, insurance is usually very time sensitive. And so I'm there to help them to, um, you know, to guide them through it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for what Thank you do. You. Miss Cindy, how about you? 
Yeah, um, Charmaine, I just want to emphasize the importance of her job because that can be extremely challenging. Oh, and thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. such a deterrent for so many people to really be advocate for themselves. So you just get caught up in the mangled mess of insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for myself, um, I'm an education nurse, and my job is to really put things in perspective for my patients in terms of where their disease is um, and what stage of chronic kidney disease, and um, really help them and support them in maybe preserving their current renal function. So for example, if they're maybe at 25%, how do we do that? Um, what are my uh, new habits that maybe I need to acquire in my daily routines of life? Um, I also am educator for Balboa and some of their employees, and I help my patients also understand how to navigate a little bit about their care and working with them on medication compliance. Um, understanding their blood pressure, understanding the importance of making um, their appointments, um, going and get their labs done. So really trying to support them and ultimately um, manage their care to where we can optimize and keep them the healthiest they can be for as long as they can be. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for Amazing, what you're doing. Cindy. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> And Mr. Mann, Mr. Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as a pharmacist in the kidney space, I follow patients um, month to month with a focus on medication adherence. And what that means is I do outreach um, and I use technology and data to determine um, different types of patients who may not be adherent to their guideline directed prescription therapy, or who may not be adherent to their doctor visits or labs. Um, so I do also um, do lifestyle um, uh, um, coaching and um, diabetes care and education. Because to Cindy's point, you know, managing your blood pressure and blood sugar will definitely impact your kidney function. And um, yeah, I just use uh, a lot of tools to help me uh, help patients help themselves. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Incredible. All those letters after your name. I wasn't <laughs> sure if I was going to be able to get all that right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I seriously had to look everything up. Um, <laughs> you know, I wanted to um, just kind of casually talk about something we were casually talking about prior to starting it was an article that you read, Cindy. Um, and I think that's kind of, it's something that's very important. I think we can bring up right now. Do you want to share that? Um, the blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, the number one cause for kidney damage is, believe it or not, is hypertension, which is blood pressure. The number two cause of kidney damage is diabetes. So for most Americans that are having problems or issues with blood pressure, and not addressing it and not staying in compliance and not checking it and not taking their blood pressure medications, ultimately um, people that run around with high blood pressure will end up in kidney disease, with kidney disease. Um, and I saw some stats um, earlier and it says that more than one in seven adults in the US or about 37 million people may have chronic kidney disease. And approximately one in five in the US with high blood pressure may have CKD, chronic kidney disease. So the numbers are alarming. And yes, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think the best way to really manage this at this point is be aware of your blood pressure. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be old. You could be in your 30s. Yeah. I have patients in their 20s. I have a patient that is 18 that right. wasn't managing, that ran around with a high, high headache for too long and knocked out his kidneys. Okay. Now there was that another was, comorbidity was with it. Yeah. I did. So that um, it's important really to listen to your body 
If something doesn't feel right, listen to your body and get some medical interventions. And if you have high blood pressure, understand what it is and take the time to address the problem because these numbers are alarming and chronic kidney disease and dialysis is on the rise. And let me say something, transplant for a kidney right now is seven to 10 years. That's today. Imagine another five years, what it's going to yeah. be like. You know yeah. what I mean? Right. So thank, thank you, Vera, for to a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Right. But thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want everyone to know that, you know, before we really get into everything to always check with your physician about any medications, any supplements, any, you know, any weird things happening with you, you feel like oh, I've always got a headache, you know, talk to your physician about right. that. So, you know, right. um, I just want to mention that before we jump in. Yeah, cause, cause and, that's not normal. Cause that's, that's not normal. normal. That's right. not normal. On your face, always have a headache. That is not normal. Yeah, exactly. But what is normal? that, you know, when you go to a pharmacy to pick up your meds, you have that option to speak with the pharmacist. Do you have any questions for the pharmacist? And, you know, Patrick, um, you were the pharmacist at the place that I went to quite some time ago. I was nervous to talk to you though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want people to know, you know, maybe you can share what you think about that. Like, what was, what was that well, like when you were um, I, I, I'm sorry you felt that way because I would have <laughs> loved to just talk your ear off. Um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe, um, you know, um, it never hurts to ask your pharmacist, um, whether you're in the drive through because it's more convenient or whatnot. I mean, I do feel like, um, no matter what um pharmacy you're using they will set aside time for you and um you might be in a situation where you have more than one chronic condition you might have diabetes and chronic kidney disease um, and high, high blood pressure so those are going to be conversations that um, you would expect to be a little longer so maybe call your pharmacist and, and not try to get that um, conversation done in the drive-through um so yeah, you um, always try to seek help if, if maybe the answer wasn't that great or you didn't feel like you got a connection, try someone else, you know, try, um, you know, contact Remend and see if um, I'm always available to help <laughs> anyone, first of all. But um, yeah, start building a network of people that um, you can go to for answers. Right, awesome. I Thank think, you. I think too, um, Kiku, to just piggyback on that just really quick is that I know that for me to talk to the pharmacist at when I'm picking up my prescriptions, like I, I just, I guess I don't feel like I know what to ask, mm. you know, like I just don't like, cause everything's written on the bottle, you know? And so I, I guess I don't really know what to ask. So is there any suggestions, Patrick? That you Yeah, can maybe that's, um, so, um, that's a great question. Um, Every state in the country has uh, a governing board of pharmacy that says the pharmacist must offer to counsel you. And um, a lot of times, unfortunately, that their talking points will just be, um, you know, some of the, uh, in addition to how to take the medication, they're gonna tell you some of the top adverse reactions that might occur. When and you may walk away from that thinking, wow, I'm gonna have that adverse reaction. Mm -hmm. So the context of the situation and the, of the conversation is it's a very busy setting. Um, you need to leave, they need to move on, mm -hmm. and they don't know where to begin either, right? So they're just gonna talk about, you know, the top issues you may have with this medication, but it's the actually, it's the most important conversation you may have regarding a medication. So it's it's an unfortunate situation, but if everyone could understand um, the context of, you know, why it is that way, then maybe later when you get home and you've got your meds at the table, you can call the pharmacist back or, you know, again, call, you know, develop a, a trusted group of um, professionals that you can talk to and maybe even write your questions down, right? Um, give yourself some time once you've got all these meds at home to, uh, formulate questions and there's no such thing as a, as a dumb question. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still write my questions down. 
I had I an too. appointment the other day and I wrote my questions down. Um, okay, so something that I'm going to be infusing in this talk is um, kidney care medication misconceptions. It's crucial for kidney patients to work closely with their healthcare team, including doctors and pharmacists, um, nurses, social workers, um, to ensure appropriate and safe medication management. So I'm gonna show you throughout the talk some common medication misconceptions, and then please jump in, Patrick, Cindy, okay. Hermaine, and um, let's get into it. Okay. Common med medication misconceptions. Medications can cure kidney disease. Uh, while medications are essential for managing symptoms and slowing down the progression of kidney disease, they cannot cure the underlying condition. Ultimately, dialysis or kidney transplantation may be necessary in advanced stages. It's kind of what Cindy was just saying, you know. But, you know, advocate for yourself too. If you don't understand what's going on, you have, usually, if you have, kidney disease, you have a, a plethora of people to speak to, right, Charmaine? Yes. Like yeah. the, like I was saying, there's, social there's worker. A whole, there's a whole team. Yep. And, and yep. a lot of the times, a lot of the times, um, just really quick, when I talk to patients, I'll even offer when I'm working with Fresenius and I talk to patients and I'll say to them, um, you know, you can use me as a point person of contact. So if you don't even know like who you're supposed to ask, you can contact me. And then if I can't help, then I can, you know, navigate through all the people in your medical team um, to see who might be best that you could talk to. And I'd like to see um, some verbiage. Um, I'd like to see more, more language um, coming from us as providers along the lines of um, these medications will help preserve your kidney function or, you know, um, and that will help um, people understand, okay, gosh, I'm not most not going to restore full function. Um, I fully understand that this medication um, or these two medications will help delay further kidney damage. So I'd like to see more verbiage from our end, you know, doctors, pharmacists, the dialysis clinics and whatnot. I mean, not the, the dialysis clinics, but you know, chronic uh, kidney disease clinics. Right, right. Thank you. My next slide is all over-the-counter medications are safe. Uh, not so much. No. Uh, many people believe that over-the-counter medications are harmless and can be taken without any concerns. However, certain over-the-counter medications, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, can be harmful to the kidneys, especially if taken in excess or for prolonged periods. This sparked a huge conversation between all of us last night. And so um, I even have a little slide about, you know, what those examples of incest look like. So I wanted to get into that and say, um, Patrick, um, yeah. can you please explain what an NSAID is and what makes them dangerous to the kidneys? So an NSAID is a, it's a type of uh, medication that knocks out inflammation or swelling. Um, compared to Tylenol, Tylenol is not an NSAID and it's safe at normal doses for your kidneys. So an NSAID like ibuprofen or Aleve or naproxen, all of the, all of the meds you had on your screen there, um, they're harmful to the kidneys because they um, decrease blood flow um, to the within the kidney and decrease its ability to filter the blood. And mm -hmm. so um, over time, um, that decreased blood flow to certain parts of the kidney, um, the working units of the kidney, um, those working units may actually die from decreased blood flow. And that's the definition really of decreased kidney function. You're, you're beginning your chronic kidney disease journey just because you've taken too much of these medications for too long of a time. Yeah. So um, they're, so back to what they are, you'll take them for a sprained ankle or inflammation or the pain of a sore throat, right? Or you might take them for a headache, okay? Which could be due to your high blood pressure, okay? So now, 
Remember these meds, if you're taking them and you don't already know that you have high blood pressure and you don't already know that you have high blood sugar, um, you've got three scenarios which are you know, damaging to the kidneys all going on at once. And you can end up with something called acute kidney injury, which is something a doctor would find if you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you had a great analogy last night when yeah. you were saying um, about the garden hose. The garden hose. Water pressure. And right. you were explaining what the about the vessels and so um so basically the, the I don't I I don't want to get too technical, but it's the there's a, a release that, that a prostag prostaglandins and they act as like a vasodilator. So vasodilator means this. So like if you have a hose, the hose is expanding or vasoconstricting, the hose is constricting, right? So when, if you think about maybe um, in your kidneys and, and renal perfusion, you know, you really want those kidneys to get perfused, right? So the idea is to perfuse your organs. When you're saying talking about perfusion, you really want that vasodilation. If you're restricting like in a hose and you fill a hose up and you're turning on the water too fast and there's not enough hose and there's not enough lining of the hose, you can see that that hose is going to be overworking itself and maybe it's going to burst. So really what you want to do is just make, think about um, the, in terms of vasoconstricting, that's going to cause potential kidney damage, right? To the arteries, it's going to cause a decrease in the GFR, which is the filtration rate. And then ultimately it will cause, you know, renal toxicity with that medication. So I don't know if that's hard for our audience to understand, but what we really want to do is we want that renal perfusion. We want that blood flow. We want those all those arteries working together. And so really by um, eating a healthier diet and meats and vegetables and plant-based and enough water. And we really want it like baby our little kidneys. Um, and we can talk about more of that too with blood pressure, but I hope that kind of- Yeah, yeah that was yeah, good. Yeah, that's good. That's, that was good. that's well, the I'm right gonna... terminology because yeah. um, it's a, I feel like it's okay to use you know, those, ex those explanations and terminology because we can always go back and and- explain because the kidney journey is a long time for patients to learn um, yeah. all the terms. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to freak people out either though. I mean, we're, let's talk about, you know, Aleve and ibuprofen, how you can take that, but are we talking about excessive amounts of this or are we saying, oh, if I take one, I'm going to, you know what I mean? Can so, we just. Um, well, okay. So anecdotally, um, you know, when I was the pharmacist at that pharmacy, you know, I met patients who told me um, it only took, you know, a dozen doses, right? Mm. So, so anecdotally, a patient shares a story, you know, I took 12 tablets or whatnot of Aleve. And um, their understanding is that's what um, caused their kidney dysfunction. Now, did the patient also have this underlying high blood pressure that Cindy mentioned? Right. Did the patient already have some underlying high blood sugar that's also damaging to the kidneys? Mm -hmm. So um, it's fair to say that all these medica all these over-the-counter medications should just be used with caution. Right. Because mm -hmm. Cindy's point, you know, one in seven patients already have chronic kidney disease. Right. They don't need to be taking a hundred a leave over mm -hmm. a week time because they have a sore throat and a sprained ankle or whatnot. So or chronic pain, you know, people chronic, chronic pain. Chronic yeah, pain. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Patrick, what about the, um, what about the difference in like where they are in their kidney journey? You know, like, does that, does that matter as well? It sure does. So, you know, um, once your doctor has diagnosed you and used your labs to place you in a specific, um, kidney disease range, like CKD stage two, three, four, or whatnot, you know, those are the stages where we want, like Cindy said, we want to preserve every tiny piece of every kidney, every nephron. We want to preserve those. So the general consensus is 
be conservative, don't take insects. Yeah. Okay. Once, now, if you're unfortunate enough to have had kidney failure and you're on dialysis, then um, you, and again, this is patient and doctor specific. Some of those patients might then be able to take an NSAID because they're on dialysis and the harm to the kidney is, is done. But there's other harms these insets cause. They can cause some acid reflux or you know, worsen an existing um, stomach ulcer or, or any acid issues you may have. And in some patients, they have some blood thinning properties. So it's never just a um, this or that. It's a, it's a very multifaceted approach to drug selection for these type of patients. Mm. And, and so once you've had a transplanted kidney, so we've talked about mm -hmm. the early stages of CKD. We talked about in, you know, dialysis. Now, once you've had your transplant, I would think that you'd want to go back to being conservative. Yeah. Limit that exposure if, if at all. Um, and if you have a pain management need, um, you have every right to talk to your doctor about mm -hmm. true pain management, which does include things like opiates or tramadol or Tylenol. So um, um, you almost have to be an advocate for yourself in that realm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah Thank you. That's a huge conversation. I, I think, thank you for dipping into that with us. Yep. Um, okay, here's another that I'd like to share. Blood pressure medications, we were just talking about hypertension, should be stopped if the blood pressure is under control. No, well, I'm just gonna read this. Some kidney patients believe that once their blood pressure is well controlled, they can stop taking their blood pressure medications. However, Blood pressure control is crucial for kidney health and stopping or altering medication without medical advice can lead to a sudden rise in blood pressure and subsequent damage to the kidneys. Yeah, you and never want to stop, never stop your blood never pressure. Stop your right? And so Patrick and Cindy, please, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Patrick, but- um, Sorry, I, I, sorry, Cindy and Kiku. I just wanted to, you know, um, advance the idea that, you know, we need to be educating um, patients that, you know, the kidneys minute to minute, hour to hour actually are involved in your, the control of your blood pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's complex chemical processes involved that um, allow the kidneys to maintain your blood pressure. So if you're a kidney patient on a kidney journey and you measure your blood pressure, and in that instant, your blood pressure is normal, it means your blood pressure med is working and the doctor has um, taken a tremendous amount of time to dial in um, your specific situation. And if you continue to check your blood sugar, your blood pressure and your, your pressures are normal and you're writing them down, perhaps in a notebook, um, that's evidence that your, your, your situation's under control and you must keep taking your meds um, to maintain that. Yeah, that's, I, I think I just like to say that it's so important that you said that because, you know, when you're chronically ill, your, your mind can play tricks on you, you know, and so for example, just to your point, you said, you know, oh, well, I'm taking, I'm t checking my blood pressure and it's great. So now I don't need my blood pressure medicine, right? Like the brain kind of tricks us into making us think that it's not, it's not because of the blood pressure medicine that, that it's, that it's good. So I think that that's really important to just, yeah, you, that just you, that. you yeah. just don't know. You just don't know. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, right. I, you mentioned, um, you know, a young, you had a young patient, Cindy, and I was one of those young patients. I was 19, I think. And I just, you know, I felt good. So, well, you take my blood pressure medication. Maybe I have a headache every once in a while, but let me take a, you know, an Aleve. <laughs> yeah, because I've yeah. got a headache, but, um, you know, you do have to educate yourself and definitely talk to your doctor. If he says, he or she says, you know, oh, we have to put you on blood pressure medication. Make sure you understand why, like understand what the blood pressure and kidney and just the effects that it has on your body. Just, you know, just want to encourage people to advocate for themselves if they don't yeah. understand what's going on. And it will 
If they already have kidney failure and they're not compliant with their blood pressure medication, it will cause further damage to the kidney. Yeah. They yeah. have to understand that. So if they're not in compliance, it's a very dangerous cycle for that kidney because to keep them informed that that kidney needs to have perfusion and with regulating that blood pressure and opening up the vessels and letting the blood through, because if they're not taking that blood pressure med medication, that it's going to be constrict, right? We want that open. We want the renal perfusion and that works with blood pressure. So if that those kidneys aren't getting properly perfused, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be cause damage. They're going to start to, those little nephrons are going to start to die. Yeah, that's great. And in fact, I I want to say that in my um, opinion, behind every non-adherent patient is an individual health belief. In other words, that particular patient has a health belief that somehow everyone here, we need to help change, right? There, it's um, maybe they're not adherent because um, they can't, they're so anxious, the mere thought of setting up adherence reminders is too much for them. So they develop a health belief, well, my, my situation is not that bad. Mm -hmm. I'll get to the med when I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have depression. And so that forms a health belief like, well, this is it for me. You know, it's, and that's sad to think about, but I feel like if we can all, you know, with doctors and social workers and dietitians and pharmacists, you know, get to each individual non-adherent patient's health belief and help them change that somehow, then we'll move the needle on some of these metrics. Thank you. Yeah. And um, Matt has a question. Um, did you want to talk about profusion, Cindy? He said, what's yeah. profusion? Yeah, I saw that too. Mm. So I, and eat, I don't know, it's like uh, in your circulation, right? You have all your organs. So it's, it's how the fluid is passing through and delivering blood to all your organs. That's perfusion. Like your blood is properly perfusing your heart so it can beat properly. Your blood flow is passing through your circulation so your lungs can breathe properly. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Um, you said thank so you. So the passage of like how your body is <clears throat> getting the fluids. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers his question. I think so. He hasn't responded. Did not. Um, okay. Let me let me move on a little bit here. I've got something. Yeah. Another. He said, "Yeah, I get it." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, Thanks, awesome. Matt. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see here. How about this misconception, guys? Herbal or natural products are safe and can replace prescribed medications. Many herbal or natural products claim to treat kidney disease or improve kidney function. However, these products are not regulated by the same standards as prescription medications and their safety and effectiveness may not be proven. It's essential to consult with a healthcare professional before using any herbal or natural supplements for kidney health. And before we as a group jump into this, um, there is a video that um, I'm working with, I mentioned Balboa Nephrology and our physicians are doing an educational video series. And we happen to have one just recently, Dr. Vaidin um, did a video about creatine versus creatine. So creatinine. So um, I wanna show this short video to you guys, if you don't mind, um, yeah. as soon as I hope and pray that it works. hear it? Hi, yeah. I'm Don Vidine. I'm a physician here at Balboa Nephrology at the uh, Chula Vista location. I've been a nephrologist for a long time. My, my hair has gotten very gray. It's been 30 years and uh, I've been here in the South Bay since 2000. I get a lot of questions about supplements and I think it's extremely important that uh, 
every patient know the supplement industry is unregulated. This means not only that what the claims the supplements do, such as making your memory better, may be untrue, but also what's on the label may not be in the pill. You need to be very careful where the source of your supplements come from. There is a label that you can see on the, uh, on the supplement. It's called the USP label, United States Pharmacopeia. It's on the uh, label of the supplement and it does guarantee that what's on the label is in the pill. Look for that. I get a lot of questions about creatine and creatinine. Creatine is a high energy compound that's used by muscle to make muscle contract, make your heart run, and make your brain think. And, and this chemical is slowly decomposed into creatinine. And creatinine has no function. It's excreted by the brain and by muscle into the urine and, and you pee it out. We measure the creatinine both in urine and in muscle as a measure of kidney function. Creatine can be a problem. Uh, there are cases of acute kidney injury, uh, particularly in bodybuilders who uh, want to gain muscle real fast and take a, a huge amount of uh, supplements. And this needs to be watched and you need to follow directions of your doctor on the amount of supplements you take. If you have kidney disease, you should be very careful with the amount of creatine you, you take. What do you guys have to say about that? He's right on. <laughs> That's he's, a good one. He's right yeah. on. And um, okay. so, uh, sorry for me to get all excited and jump in because. No, I'm happy you are excited about that. This yes. is, uh, yeah, the supplement market, um, you know, like Dr. Vidine said, it's unregulated. And I would like to uh, share that most supplements, when you take them for what they're, um, you know, what they're touted to, to do, you don't really get any sensation that you're even on them. And so these manufacturers add things to these supplements to give you a, maybe a little bit of energy. And you're going to think, oh my gosh, I'm taking this supplement to regrow my hair and I feel more energy. It must be working. And I don't know if that makes mm -hmm. sense, but the things that they put, the things that they add to these supplements most often are an herb called ephedra, right? It's a stimulant. It makes your blood, it might make your blood vessels, you know, like Cindy was saying, um, shrink in size smaller vessels, higher pressure, less perfusion, right? Mm -hmm. So um, ephedra is added to these products just to make you feel like you're on them. They add caffeine, you know, caffeine's a stimulant, can increase your blood pressure. So I'm, yeah. I'm a little more conservative than Dr. Vidine. I would just say, you know, if you're beginning your kidney journey, whatever stage you land in on your journey, it's time to go through the cabinet and remove all the supplements. And I know that's harsh because again, a lot of patients have a health belief that, you know what, maybe the supplement's gonna help reverse this CKD, CKD thing I was just diagnosed with. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very difficult. I do see patients, um, you know, when I'm reviewing med lists, you know, they, they list off a lot of, they list their prescription meds and then they say, okay, well, I'm taking, you know, this, that, and the other. And then I have my conversation with them in the best way possible that, you know, these are not ideal. And um, so, yeah, it's a very important topic for the patient on the kidney journey. The supplements are typically not good. We have a, a quick question from Matt. Um, so when you say supplements, does that include vitamins? No. So, um, um, so um, most patients, um, would um, be prescribed a renal vitamin um, for its B and for its B, vitamin B content and folic acid. And so um, as long as you're sticking to um, that doctor order, you'll be fine. Those are highly regulated type vitamins. Okay. Um, I have a, oops. I have a little screen I wanted to share just to follow up on this. 
sources from the National Kidney Foundation, um, the facts about herbal supplements are true for everyone with or without kidney disease. Herbal supplements often have more than one name, a common name and a plant name, and some common concerns include the following. Do you, do you wanna touch base on what Dr. Vidine had mentioned about them being, you know, if they don't have that yeah. regulatory sticker? Uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, um, there's a bit of uh, Fifth Avenue marketing going on with every supplement that comes to market. And those folks who are developing the label on these bottles and at, and marketing it, you know, there's a reason why they're putting the the Latin um, genus and species of the plant that it comes from, because unfortunately the average consumer is going to say, "Wow, ginkgo biloba, that's got to be good," or ephedra, that's got to be good, and they're not, um, and so. The reason those labels are so fancy and medical looking is just marketing. It really is, um, mm -hmm. um, and it's unfortunate. And I don't ever wanna take away anyone's hope. That's not what this is about. If you have a health belief that whatever supplement you bought at Costco will turn things around, I respect that. But as a part of your healthcare team and potentially a provider for you, I wanna begin a a new thought process um, for you and help you realize what's really important. Thank you. Did you have anything to add with that, Cindy? Uh, just that be careful. Like if you're, if you have CKD to always talk to your physician, if you're taking a supplement, because it could have added potassium, because remember, keep in mind, you already, your kidneys are no longer working to the capacity that they need to be working. So A, they're not going to absorb that potassium. Maybe your supplements have potassium. Maybe they're going to interfere with other medications that you're already taking, you know, and they can have a bad interaction. Um, and never take a water pill. People think water pills are good. Never take a water pill. I don't care if your kidneys are good or bad. I've just heard nothing but par parable response on water pills. Well, that's what you know we call water pills. Um, so yeah, definitely, and and be careful because um, there are a lot of supplements out there that can make your your kidney function worse. So yes. always talk to your physician first if you feel like you need to take a supplement, and always have the advice of your physician. Um, especially phosphorus, you know, we have patients that can't take phosphorus or limit their diet in phosphorus. And there's plenty, there's some supplements on out there that are, have phosphorus, potassium, um, and interference with their medication. So watch out for those things. Absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And sodium's another one. And then we could go for a long time. Like, doesn't a Dr. Pepper have like, you know, like four steaks worth of phosphorus, you know, like, Wow. I mean, we could keep, we could expand this chat, but yeah. Wow. yeah. Right. Don't drink soda at all. If you are dark serious. sodas. Yeah. Wow. Dark sodas are bad. Okay. Um, I wanted to add to that just really quick that um, shortly after I transplanted the first time uh, I was taking this, I had started taking like this natural, I don't even remember what it was, some garbage. Um, but anyway, it, it impacted my, test results of my labs like so it gave like a false reading is what it did and so I just wanted to add that too because you know there that could also be a problem you know if you're taking stuff and the doctors are not able to treat you based on wrong information you know so that could be very dangerous as well yeah great point yeah exactly Patrick did you mention quiet supplements you're did you mention that already? And I didn't hear it. Um, yeah. So um, I like that. I don't know. It's a term I use. So, you know, um, when, um, when you're faced with perhaps this diagnosis and you're don't know where to turn and maybe you go to the health food store or whatnot, and you see a supplement section, again, you might reach for something that's touted to help you feel better for whatever reason and um in and of itself those ingredients really aren't going to give you any sensation that you're taking it so they mm. they quietly add this caffeine 
the ephedra, the stimulants. Their sole purpose there is to make you realize, well, I got a kick when I took that. I should keep taking it because it must be working. And that's what I mean by like quiet supplement. Um, okay. Yeah. I make sure that I touch base on that. And um, I do have one question, but I'm going to, I hope we don't run out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Um, I think it's for Dennis. So what happens if you miss a, a, dial, a dialysis treatment, Patrick? Well, um, if you miss a dialysis treatment, whether it's peritoneal or hemodialysis, you're going to have a buildup of your nitrogenous waste. So your, your, your waste products, your potassium will, um, could go up, your phosphorus could go up. Um, and um, each one of those can impact a lot of different body systems. So if you're you know, the nitrates aren't removed, that can cause insomnia, all right? Um, if your potassium isn't removed, that can cause an irregular heartbeat. Over time, if your phosphate isn't, phosphorus isn't being removed completely, can lead to, you know, bone disorders. And um, so um, missing one treatment is um, just as is important um, and missing many treatments is worse, but equally important. So um, developing an adherence to medications, developing an adherence to dialysis treatment, developing an adherence to um, your doctor appointments and obtaining your labs really just starts with, you know, your own health beliefs, how you believe you're doing, um, things like anxiety, insomnia, depression. I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, and you know what? I, I asked his question wrong. I'm sorry, Dennis. Oh. Um, he wanted to know what are the consequences of missing a day of transplant meds? Okay. Which leads into what you're saying, but yeah. specifically. So, um, well, that's uh, another. So missing a day of transplant meds, um, shouldn't make you feel bad because everyone there's not everyone is a hundred percent adherent i have an uncle-in-law who has been adherent every day for 33 years but that's another story um no. so don't let it make you feel bad right and hopefully um my advice would be that you um take a minute and recall, oh, how did I get there? What happened that made me forget that? Was it because I was tired at night and I missed the evening dose? Or was it because I wasn't supposed to take it with food and I ate all day? And work backwards from there. And if you develop the habits around missing one random dose, you'll be really good at adherence in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to touch base more on adherence in a second, but I know that Charmaine has a great question too about uh, diabetic medications and insulin affordability. Yeah. Thanks, Kiku. So I just wanted to ask um, if we could, Patrick, if you could touch on um, oftentimes when I, um, in my role, I, I don't normally handle um, pharmacy, you know, medications sure. or insurance and things like that. But the common theme is always about how expensive insulin is. And there's so many patients that, um, that just can't afford to take it. It's not covered and, and all this. And then I recently heard about um, some type of new copay maximum or top sure. out or something like that. So yeah, if you could, yeah. if you could, yeah. So yeah, so um, there, uh, we have great news on the insulin front and um, insurers are not allowed to charge you more than $35 per month Per insulin, okay, so that is tremendous. When that's success. amazing, yeah. So I'm hopefully, show my slide about it. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully, um, yeah, and hopefully we can help move the needle on adherence to insulin. Yes, and um, that will help move the needle, the clinical needle, on A one C, and even kidney disease progression. Yeah, there it is. Look, yeah. effective this year, January. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, now we can uh, those conversations that we used to be having about the cost. Now we can spend that time um, 
getting back to diabetes education, right? You're no longer helping yeah. them figure out um, how they're going to afford the insulin. And now you can spend time on what a complex carbohydrate is or what a, um, you know, um, what to do on a sick day when they have diabetes. So lots of opportunity. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that great news. That's amazing. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's, let's go back to um, adherence. Um, so there was something that you had mentioned to me today, Patrick, um, about the day in a kidney journey, which I have, I also have another slide for, but can you um, provide I, any of you, can you provide information on medication adherence strategies to help patients stay compliant with their prescribed treatment? And you touched base a little bit previously, Patrick, on it, but I, I want to get back into it. And I'm going to show the slide that you suggested. And I hope you like my slide, Patrick. Sure. <laughs> okay. So a day in a kidney journey. Do you want to go over what, why you were telling me about this and what it means? Yeah. To yeah. So. Um... Um, and I know Cindy's going to have some great points on the, on a lot of these, but, um, you know, the slide says that everything a day in the kidney journey. So it, the kidney journey requires, um, daily adherence to your medications and, and the best case scenario, you know, daily blood pressure measurements and Cindy may want, you know, to talk about more frequent or less frequent, but adherence to your doctor visits and labs and your meal plan and your physical activity, right? Mm -hmm. Adherence to all of those. So how do we, how do we track, how, how does a patient remind themselves to be adherent? Well, they can program the iPhone or you can have a paper calendar and write down every day, you know, and the, you know, 6 a.m. I do this, 7 a.m. I do that. Um, you can have a spouse or a loved one help you with adherence. Um, you can keep your medication bottles in a spot of the house all together where you have a glass of water ready to take your medications. Um, you can potentially sit and reflect um, if you're struggling with adherence to any of these um, concepts, you can try to take a moment each day to reflect what's preventing me from being adherent. Um, I know some patients who don't have the energy to create their own calendar because um, missing a dose of a medication causes guilt and regret, right? Mm -hmm. Or not responding to this alert to go take their immunosuppressant because they have a transplant. They get guilt and regret and they don't want to hear about it from, they don't want to they don't want me to look at their data and see, oh, you're not getting your refills on time. They don't want to hear it from me. So the point is, um, take time to reflect what makes you adherent, what works for you, what makes you non-adherent. I'd like to share, you know, my, uh, it's so uncanny how I ended up in, in kidney care because I never met my father-in-law, but he had his own kidney journey. Um, he did receive a kidney, um, in Arizona, um, in 2000, um, as a result of polycystic kidney disease. And, um, I would have to say, um, this example right from his kidney journey is very telling about his dedication to adherence. He must've been struggling with blood pressure control. And this is just a sheet. Um, unfortunately he didn't put the year on it, but it's June 5th at 4 p.m. He called his doctor and they changed it. They doubled his dose. And he was so driven to um, staying adherent and charting every blood pressure. Like, um, this is so touching to me. It's Again, it's uncanny that I'm in this space, but um, look at the level of adherence um, he strived for. And um, not every patient has that drive or that health belief, mm -hmm. but it would be great if we could get everyone there. Right. And yeah. um, thank you for allowing me to share that. So, yeah. Thank you yeah, for sharing really that. You know, it's, it's when you're diagnosed with chronic kidney disease and have to go through your own kidney journey, it's a sense of 
loss. It's a sense of losing control. I mean, people are telling you, okay, you have to Thank take you. this, you have to do this to stay alive, essentially. And so you are dealing with that, a whole new lifestyle. Um, just, you know, it's a, you're dealing with loss and depression. And so there's, there's so much that leads into medication adherence. Um, you know, I don't remember what, well, currently my husband tells me every day, first thing in the morning, you take your medication. And when it comes home, do you take your meds? So, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have someone like my husband to, to do that, but, you know, any tips that, um, you know, people can hear about is going to be helpful because everyone's situation is different. And again, it's a lifestyle change. It's not that you can't have a good life, but it's just different from what you're used to. And so I think that, you know, that feeling of loss of control is a big part of that. And I think too, that it's really about um, getting new habits, you know, and reprogramming. And for me, the transplant, the transplant drugs are, you know, it, it's a it's almost robotic at this point. When I get up, you know, I set my phone on my dresser. First thing I do, I set my phone on my dresser because then when I'm looking for my phone, you know, it's going off because it's time to take my my drugs at nine o'clock, or you know, and then so the phone is right there, right next to my pillbox, you know. So, um, so that's what works for me. Even though I have the alarm, I still have to have that safety net in the morning right. time of putting my phone right where my meds are at. Right. Right. Well, we, yeah. we are at time, but I want to um, say before we wrap up today's webinar, I'd like to ask our panelists, what key messages or insights do you hope our viewers will take away from our comprehensive discussion on uh, kidney care and medication? Um, Cindy, you've been quiet for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think the biggest part about it is when you are diagnosed with kidney disease, ask yourself, what are your goals on your journey? And maybe once you understand what your goals are, you can better navigate your care. Um, medication compliance and exercise, um, following up on your doctor visits, really making sure you're getting your labs done, paying attention to um, your blood pressure, managing your blood pressure and checking it every day. Make a log. If you notice something different in it, speak up, call your nephrologist, let them know your blood pressure medication is no longer working. Um, supplements. If you have a question about a supplement, now we have all these beautiful my chart portals. Send your physician a message. Ask them if it's okay. Boom, They're, those portals are so much easier to communicate yeah. through now instead of yeah. a phone call and waiting through the phone trees, messaging through the portals. You can get a quicker answer, quicker response that will that could potentially save your kidney function. So um, that would be the message for, for me to the audience is to really um, dive in and be your advocate and pay attention to those things. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. You always have such good closing. I know. Comments. Charmaine. Amazing. Um, I would say, you know, coming from a patient's perspective to really listen to your body. Um, if you're having a headache every day, that's not normal. You know, if you're feeling, um, if you're feeling fatigued every day, that's not normal. Um, to reach out to, um, to, as Cindy said, the portals are so easy to just shoot a message. You're on your phone anyway. Just get into the app and send a message, you know? Right. Um, think of it as a text message, you know, to make it fun or whatever. But um, but I think the main thing is just listen to your body and your body tells you what it needs. And so um, if it's if something is wrong, your body's going to tell you, you just have to listen to it. Thank you. Great tips. Patrick, thank you so I, much for being here, Patrick, too. Well, you're welcome. Okay. I, um my privilege thank you so um i would just want patients to know that um to practice every day is practice every day is practicing good health and the event that you're practicing for is your next doctor visit or your next family get together when you go to those events your doctor will say, wow, your labs are great. Your blood, your vitals are great. 
you're doing great. So just take every, you know, every day, one day at a time, practice good health every day, which includes, you know, attention to your, your kidney diet, physical activity, adherence to your medications, and um, great practice will, will lead to better outcomes. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, I want to thank everybody again. It's, it's that time now, though, where I, I remind you to join us for our next episode of Kidney, Kidney Conversations with Remend and show you what that's all about. So next month, join us for our first ever resource edition. We're gathering interesting panelists to provide kidney care education from local and national outlets. So I want to once again, thank our panelists for not only being here, but for the important work that you do for the kidney community. I hope that the insights shared have been helpful in guiding your choices. Uh, and I also want to remind everyone that with the right support and care, life can continue to be fulfilling and enjoyable. Many individuals on dialysis continue to work, travel, and engage in their favorite activities. It's important to maintain a positive outlook and embrace the possibilities that come with each new day. So remember that you're not alone and there's a supportive community of health professionals and loved ones who stand ready to assist you in every step of the way. You can reach out to us at remend.org, Remend US on Facebook and on our YouTube channel and also our Instagram page, at SD Remen, that's our handle there. So thank you everyone once again for watching and um, Kiku, thank you fun. so much. Thanks Kiku. Kiku. Guys, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you guys so much. Thank you Charmaine. Thank you, guys. Thank nice you. to see everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye guys. Good night, thank you.